Hello, everyone. I'm Ben Dianim uh, with Paul Hastings, and I'm really happy to be here today to talk about AI, uh, legal and policy considerations, and landmines to avoid. Before I begin, and, and lest I forget, I want to uh, make sure everyone knows that you can leave questions in the question uh, chat box, and I'd be happy to answer them, um, or at the end of the presentation. Okay, so way to go. First question is, what's the big deal? Why do we care about AI and landmines to avoid? Well, as I'm sure all of you know, you wouldn't be here today listening to this session. We have an increasing reliance on machine learning and artificial intelligence um, in all aspects of our lives. Uh, here on the slide are just a few credit and financial benefits and decision-making, employment decisions, transportation, and others. And so as we increasingly rely on these types of uh, on automated decisions in these types of areas, it becomes increasingly important to understand how we're doing that and what the various uh, considerations, costs, and benefits might be. So first though, it's worth asking ourselves, what is AI? Um, and I, I took this definition, the definition on this slide, the quite lengthy set of definitions on this slide from um, the Future of Artificial Intelligence Act, which is pending in Congress, and which I'll talk about a little bit later, because I think it really is a useful way to frame the issue. Um, it defines an AI initially as artificial systems that perform tasks under a variety of circumstances without significant human oversight, or that can learn from their experience. And in general, the more human-like uh, the the uh, intelligence, um, the more it can be said to be used. Or to, it can be said to use artificial intelligence. Later on, the, stat, the bill says systems that think like humans, systems that act like humans, a set of techniques that seek to approximate some cognitive task, systems that act rationally, perhaps implying that, that thinking like humans uh, somehow equates to acting rationally, which may or may not be true in real life. But that's how the, stat, the bill uh, conceives of artificial intelligence. And it also talks about general artificial intelligence versus narrow, and that's also an important concept. General AI is a notional future AI system that exhibits apparently intelligent behavior, at least as advanced as a person, again, hu the human referent point, I'm gonna come back to that, across the range of cognitive, emotional, and social behaviors, whereas a narrow AI is one that addresses specific applications, such as playing games, driving a car, uh, recognizing a face, um, very discrete tasks. Okay, so as, as I've already emphasized a couple of times, there seems to be an equation between intelligence and human, right? We want our AI system to be as good as humans or like humans, but is that really what we want, right? Or do we actually demand something better? And I think in thinking about that, the example of self-driving vehicles is a great one because when we, when we think about self-driving cars, um, no one is promoting self-driving vehicles uh, on the premise that they will be as safe as human drivers. In fact, if they were as safe as human drivers, I think no one would have interest in self-driving vehicles. It's, it's, it's sort of like the back, backseat driver phenomenon. When you're sitting in the backseat, you're always a better driver than the person in front of you because you have that perhaps illusory, but nonetheless um, a, a perceived feeling of control because you're the one at the wheel. Whereas when you're in the backseat, you're depending upon that other person. Similarly, if AI could just drive as well as we could, we would not tolerate that. And in fact, AI is being sold in the context of self-driving cars as being better than human, as bringing um, accident rates and mortality rates further down below what they are today with human drivers. So really, when you think about it, and again, we'll stick with the car context uh, for a minute, um, what are we really trying to do? And what does safety really mean? Because it isn't really enough simply to say we went better than human. Because what does that mean? For whom? Under what circumstances? And in, in, in the context of, uh, of autonomous vehicles, uh, MIT has a really fascinating uh, site called moralmachine.net, where they ask that question and they attempt essentially to crowdsource ethics, the crowdsource, the programming of AI in this area. And so what they do is, is they present scenarios um, that would confront a self-driving vehicle and they ask, the users, us, us, the public, to select what we think the self-driving car should do. And I have reflected on the slide here of the very basic first scenario, which is a car driving with five occupants. Um, and you'll see on the slide, on the picture on the left, if the car proceeds straight ahead, it will hit a big concrete barrier, killing uh, all of the occupants, we're told. Um, or if it swerves to avoid the barrier, it will hit five 
pedestrians, killing those five pedestrians. So what would you have the self-driving vehicle do? Now, actually, as a point of interest, that scenario is actually one that is, um, I believe, fairly one-sided in favor of hitting the barrier, um, the prejudice there being inaction versus action, as opposed to swerving and hitting the pedestrians. Um, although um, other scenarios, although firstly, I'm not sure if that is what a person would do in real life, but setting that aside, um, other scenarios are quite complicated. And what the, what the Moore machine does is it will provide different mixes of pedestrians and different mixes of occupants in the car. In some cases, uh, there'll be children. In some cases, they'll be elderly. In some cases, they'll be pregnant women. In some cases, there'll be Nobel Prize winning scientists. In other cases, they might be convicted criminals. In some cases, the pedestrians will be walking with the light. In other cases, they'll be walking against the light. In some cases, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the, by, the not doing anything will hit the pedestrian as opposed to hitting the barrier. So there are various scenarios that the moral machine um, proposes or provides, and then it takes the results and comes up with you know, what the crowd believes should happen. Um, and it attempts to, uh, to analyze it by, uh, by nationality. It'll tell you, you know, what folks in the United States generally say, what people in Spain and other countries. It's very interesting. But really, um, the question is, is that how we want to develop our AI? And in fact, by the way, if we did use the moral machine uh, approach, we'd find that more often than not, you end up killing the elderly because elderly lives are valued at a, less, at a lower level than others, um, consistently actually across nationalities in the moral machine scenarios. So it's an interesting question as to how we should approach this. And uh, I'm a lawyer, so what I frequently will ask when I'm not sure about something like that is, well, what does the law say? Well, in the United States, there is very little law on this topic. The closest we get to these broader issues of ethics and values when it comes to AI is the Federal Trade Commission, which in 2020 updated its AI guidance and included within that guidance certain key principles, key principles of transparency, disclosing when you use data that you will collect and how you will use it, um, clear explanations for the system, for the factors that go into it, Fairness, looking at both the inputs that go in and the outcomes. Are the inputs fair? Are they being gathered in a fair way? And are the outcomes that are being generated fair? Um, user rights, rights to understand the data that's being provided and how it's being processed. Robustness, competence, it's gotta be done in a capable way. And accountability, at the end of the day, you have to be accountable for the results. But they're very high level concepts and it's just guidance, not an enforcement, uh, not a regulation, not a, um, an enforcement scheme. Beyond that, the United States, at, uh, in the United States, activity in the area of AI has really focused on increasing investment in AI and competitiveness in AI. In AI. So in February of 2019, then President Trump issued an executive order establishing the American AI Initiative that really was about investment. Um, very brief mentions of privacy, civil liberty, and safety concerns, but no direction. The Office of Management and Budget, an executive branch agency in late 2020, warned against approaches that would stifle AI adoption um, and emphasized what they called 10 stewardship principles that are there on the slide. You can see some of those principles do uh, touch on the ethical and moral questions that we've been discussing, fairness, non-discrimination, disclosure, transparency. Um, but again, the main uh, objective of that guidance was to encourage, to stimulate, to drive AI adoption. In January 2021, in the waning days of the administration, the Department of Transportation issued um, oops, issued comprehensive, I've got to go back, I'm sorry about that. Um, bear with me for a sec. Issued comprehensive uh, guidance on, on automated vehicles. Um, again, prioritizing uh, safety and speed to market and leaving really sort of key questions unanswered. Um, in January, also the same month of uh, 2021, the National Artificial Intelligence Initiative Office was established. And then in March, 2021, uh, under the Biden administration, but um, the completing a process that was really conducted under the prior administration, um, the National Security Commission on Artificial Intelligence issued its report on AI. And again, all of these efforts are geared toward competitive, competitiveness, geared toward, um, toward moving the ball forward on AI. Okay, um, all right. Uh, again, with the exception of, of that FTC guidance, that really, really, the focus really has been on accelerating R&D. And that's also been true of most legislative initiatives in Congress, which have been about funding AI or encouraging executive branch agencies to pursue AI. 
um, not really focused for the most part on ethical or discrimination or other kinds of questions. So what's ahead now under, under the new administration? Well, firstly, the, um, the Biden administration and its Office of Science and Technology Policy has a new deputy director, Alondra Nelson. She happens to be a sociologist who's written about the societal impacts of AI, emphasizing the need for accountability, which may portend an increased focus on those kinds of issues, trying to save us from being locked in the trapped in the cell of an amoral AI. And the, the, the illustration there, which shameless plug for my daughter as an artist, is her piece of work. Um, and increasing the emphasis on potential harms and risks associated with AI. Um, Abroad, looking at a multi, the multilateral context, we have seen some focus on these issues. The OECD um, has issued principles on artificial intelligence. The OECD principles are backed by over 40 nations. Um, they're not legally binding, but they're intended to influence legislation. And you can see there the principles um, are very similar to the FTC guidelines, not surprisingly and not coincidentally. Things like inclusive and sustainable growth and well-being, human-centered values, again, bringing us back to this idea that we want to replicate something that's human about us in the AI, transparency and explainability, robustness and safety and accountability. Uh, the G20, in its ministerial statement on trade and digital economy, um, uh, also issued similar principles, uh, calling for a human-centered future society. Um, the AI principles again, that are reflected in that ministerial statement are very similar to the OECD guidelines. Now, in terms of legislation pending in Congress right now, uh, the only bill that really speaks to these kinds of questions is the one that I mentioned at the outset of my presentation, the Future of Artificial Intelligence Act of 2020. It, um, it was introduced by Senator Maria Cantwell from Washington State. With a GOP co-sponsor, Senator Young from Indiana. That's noteworthy because prior legislative initiatives that attempted to raise these kinds of questions have generally been sponsored by Democratic members, not Republican members. Um, this bill would establish a federal advisory committee under the Department of Commerce to advise on these kinds of questions, accountability, legal rights, bias, civil rights, things of that nature, really emphasizing those ethical questions. Um, now, it's important to, to not overstate the, this, the impact of this bill, even if it is enacted, because it really is establishing an advisory committee. It's not creating new legal um, norms or requirements. Unlike the prior bill uh, that was in the last Congress, the Algorithmic Accountability Act, um, which did not pass um, and really had far more teeth to it. This was a bill that was sponsored in the House by 32 uh, Democratic members and in the Senate by Senators Wyden and Booker from Oregon and New Jersey, respectively, both of whom were also Democrats. And it would have mandated the FTC to issue regulations requiring automated decision impact assessments, which um, are, um, for those of you in the privacy world, we'll, you'll recognize that concept, very similar to data protection impact assessments, um, which also will be mandated under the bill. It would cover all businesses that exceed the thresholds that are stated in that uh, on the slide, over $50 million in revenue, possessing or controlling personal information of more than a million consumers or devices uh, and data brokers, um, and um, would uh, treat violations of the, of the law as um, uh, unfair or deceptive acts or practices, which are penalties that are within the province of the FTC to enforce. It also would have granted states the power to bring civil suits against entities that violated the act. Now, this was a bill, as I said, that was in, introduced in 2019. It did not pass. And with the new Congress, it's no longer a bill. It would need to be reintroduced. And to my knowledge, as of the time that I'm recording this, it has not yet been reintroduced. Um, so we'll have to see what happens to it. Now, the states, in the meantime, are not really sitting around waiting for the feds to take action. Um, like in privacy, states have moved forward in this space. No, no state has passed uh, legislation as yet, but there are bills pending in at least three, California, Washington State, and Maryland. Um, the Washington and Maryland bills would require government agencies to assess a, the discriminatory impacts of automated decision systems before implementing them. Um, the California uh, bill would apply to any business in California um, that utilizes automated decision systems, uh, provides a person with a program that uses automation, automated decision systems. Now, there's a few interesting things about, uh, about these state bills um, that are worth noting, just in terms of the, the, um, the 
politics that surround them and their potential scope. In the first case, one thing you might note is that all three of these states are what are called blue states. Um, I don't think that's surprising because I think that's where we've seen most interest in these kinds of measures, at least so far, although I don't, I don't think that will, that will always be the case. Um, in addition, the, the, the Washington and Maryland bills are more, more modest in, uh, in objective or in aspiration. They would apply to agencies, government agencies, not to private businesses. And even the California bill, unlike privacy laws, which tend to apply to any business that collects personal information about a person in that state, uh, this bill applies to businesses in the state. So a business outside of California that's dealing with Californians at least would not appear to fall within the scope of the bill as currently drafted. That's a, 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 a material difference between this kind of legislation and privacy legislation, and it will be interesting to see if that continues. Okay, so in the meantime, without uh, any actual law fed at the federal or state level, what are, what are ways to think about approaching AI if you're attempting to deploy an AI system or develop an AI system in your enterprise? So there are what I like to call four pillars of artificial intelligence governance that I think makes sense to think about. And they'll track, you'll see the, the FTC guidelines, the OECD statement of principles, the G20 principles, they really are uh, not particularly innovative or, um, or um, revolutionary, but I think they're fairly intuitive. Um, the first is fairness or effectiveness, implementing procedures and standards to ensure systems are meeting their intended purpose without bias, competence, specifying the knowledge and skills required of the developers and operators so that you can promote trust and, make, and mitigate the risk of bad outcomes. Transparency is what it sounds like. Um, revealing appropriate amounts of information, I'll come back to that in a little bit, um, so that um, users and, and the public can have trust in what you are doing in, in the system. Accountability, making sure that someone is responsible for implementing and for outcomes associated with the AI system, which requires in turn measurability. You have to have some measure, way to measure outcomes so that you can be accountable for them. Um, now, not all AI applications require equally strong or similarly structured governance programs. For example, some AIs will be doing things that are far more important than others um, that will involve human life or, or liberty. Um, and those things, those types of applications, you might want to um, require stronger programs from than those that maybe are less important, like those that determine what Netflix movie to recommend for you to watch. Right? Similarly, strength in one pillar may reduce the need for strength in others. These are not uh, all four equal equal things. Uh, and so one, uh, having, uh, having extra strength in one might allow you to have somewhat less strength in the other. Now let's d dive down a little bit into these pillars. So fairness and effectiveness, what does that uh, entail? Um, measuring effectiveness, because you don't know whether something is effective unless you measure it. There are a few different ways to do that. One if one way uh, it might be single system validation where you have one app, but you do a lot of sampling and review of data um, to measure the outcomes and determine, uh, and determine their effectiveness. Another might be multi-system benchmarking where you've got comparative evaluation. You have two systems or three or four and you can, that are all designed to serve the same objective and you can measure comparative performance. Um, so neither one is right or wrong. They're different ways of accomplishing the same thing. Um, when defining those metrics, of course, you have to use metrics that make sense in your context. Um, what does that mean? Well, they have to meet your objectives, whether those are commercial objectives or research objectives. And it's important, I think, to be inclusive in defining them by seeking input from the various stakeholders to make sure that you're not overlooking things that are important or, um, or assigning uh, disproportionate value or lack of value to particular metrics. Um, again, robust human-led sampling and auditing, as I mentioned, is important. And it's important also to know that bigger data is not always better data. You have to decide what data really is necessary, what data is appropriate, what data is relevant, perhaps is a better way of saying it. And that's the data that you want to collect and, and analyze. Okay. Um, it's also very important when you're dealing with effectiveness uh, to combat bias and algorithmic decision-making, that's both an ethical imperative and it can be a legal one in certain contexts, for example, in employment-related decisions. Um, and so in doing that, it's important to make sure you're focusing on the demographic, demographic profile of the data set to make sure that the data set is appropriately representative, but also that your AI team itself is diverse um, to make sure you've got a, a diversity of perspectives, um, of backgrounds, um, uh, of disciplines, so that you are, um, 
taking into account and looking at the issue holistically. Because again, if the, if the objective is at least is to create a human uh, or a human approximation, or really, as we discussed before, a better than human approximation, then you want that, that uh, system to have the benefit of as, as holistic a set of inputs as possible. You also want to consider uh, equality of treatment versus equality of impact. What is it that you're striving for? Are you striving for both? Are you striving for one or the other? Um, and there's no one answer to that. It really will depend on the circumstances. Um, uh, and once, you, once you've decided that with the appropriate input from the team and from the uh, uh, constituents, the stakeholders, then you can design toward it. Um, there's also a question of competence. Um, your, AI, your AI team should be competent, right? That almost sounds um, uh, obvious, it is obvious, um, but what does competence mean in this context? Uh, it's not necessarily just that they're good programmers, right? Being a good programmer isn't gonna answer the question of what to program. And so having um, uh, the right set of disciplines represented is gonna be incredibly important. There's a question whether there should be regulatory standards that surround that. I don't know the answer. I don't, I don't have an answer. I think there are arguments for and against. I, I'm not sure what a regulatory standard would say today, but perhaps down the road, there'll be enough definition to do that. But in the meantime, it's important to be thoughtful about the set of skills that you're looking for when you're put, putting together a team uh, uh, to design and operate an AI system. In addition, there need to be safeguards against improper use or operation of the system. And really importantly, there have to be a set of defined circumstances where the system operator should override the system. Um, those, this should not be an ad hoc determination. You should give uh, proactive thought to when that should happen and, uh, and document that so that the operator knows when uh, an override needs to take place. And you should be continually reevaluating, um, uh, continually gauging the effectiveness, effectiveness of the system and making adjustments as appropriate. Transparency. Transparency is incredibly important as I've already described. Um, you have to think about um, in, 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 in practicing transparency, what you really are going to share. This doesn't mean that you share your confidential IP, you don't put your source code out there necessarily, but you need to think about how can I communicate what we are doing in a way that's understandable and digestible and accurate without revealing sensitive proprietary IP. And in doing that, uh, I think it's really important for uh, there to also be um, whistleblower protection to individuals who offer information that the system is not being operated properly or producing improper results because sometimes the best information, the best feedback you can get is coming from those kinds of sources, not from your regular processes. Um, and as, 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 as is the case with um, escalation or override, it's also important to have a human-led appellate process for algorithmic decisions. Uh, and um, having periodic transparency reports can be very useful as well where you put out annually or biannually or quarterly reports that summarize um, how you were doing. Very similar to how some of the large ISPs, for example, put out reports about how many times they get government subpoenas or respond to government requests, national security letters. The idea is they're trying to build confidence by providing information to the public. There, they're legally constrained in what they can share. So often it's very high level information. Here, that won't often be the case. And so companies can make that decision themselves. But providing that kind of reporting proactively can be very helpful. Accountability, um, having well-documented lines of responsibility among those who operate the system. Who is in charge? Who do they, who, to whom do they report? When do those people step in? All very important. Training is critical. Um, internal oversight mechanisms and audits are important. Um, and, um, and, and making sure that there's an understanding of the legal and ethical standards to which you are adhering is also critical. And as of today, Often the case, it will be the case that that'll be mostly ethical as opposed to legal because there isn't uh, a lot of law out there. Um, although in some cases, as I mentioned, there will be laws against discrimination in the employment context and in the credit context and others. But, um, but often it will be ethical questions that you're gonna, ethical standards that you're gonna wanna establish. So how do these pillars translate into legal liability in the case of the self-driving vehicle or the employment or credit decision or the AI directed medical treatment or even God forbid legal uh, advocacy, the AI lawyer? Um, it's really not clear. Uh, again, in some cases there is um, generally applicable legal uh, guidance or legal or generally applicable legal requirements like in the context of non-discrimination and employment and credit. But in other cases, there aren't yet legal standards. And it's almost, you know, there's a hur technology hurdle, developing the technology to do what we want it to do. And there's a legal hur hurdle, developing the legal scaffolding to surround that technology. 
And um, it's not, those things aren't built yet. Neither one of those is built. And as I mentioned at the outset, there's this underlying question that we all still have. Do we expect more from the AI than we do from each other? I think the answer is yes, we do. And the autonomous vehicle is just one example of it. But I think throughout AI, we are building AI because we want it to be better than we are. And the question becomes, what does better mean? Because it's not always so obvious. And when you have the ability to be better, um, that presents choices that didn't present themselves previously, so we never had to think about them. Do we smash into the barrier or do we swerve and hit the pedestrians? Does it matter who those pedestrians are? Those are questions we've never really had to grapple with as a society, but if we're going to program systems to govern these actions, we need to. And we don't want to leave it just to a programmer. We need to think about more broadly how we're going to have them developed. So what do we do? So in the meantime, in the, in the here and now, I think firstly, it's clear that we focus on the narrow, the narrow AI, not the general AI. I think those are the applications that are the imminent applications. Um, we, need, we need to think about AI similarly to the way we think about data privacy. An AI impact assessment, which as you may recall was, uh, was, was a uh, requirement of the 2019 bill um, that did not become law, I think nonetheless is good practice because uh, impact assessments force us to think proactively about what we're doing before we start and to build those considerations into the design of the product. We need to have a well-defined purpose. What are we trying to accomplish? Um, vet that purpose thoroughly through uh, an inclusive and diverse set of stakeholders. Um, make sure we have the right competencies represented, but we have the right skill sets, the right disciplines. Again, it's not just about coding or engineering. We're not just trying to build a better mousetrap. We're trying to create the mouse, that's that, that analogy. We're trying to create the mind behind it. And when we're, we're trying to create the mind, um, our minds are holistic. Our minds include liberal arts, not just technical arts, not just, not just science, not just STEM. And if we want an AI to, uh, to, again, approximate a human, it needs to have those kinds of inputs as well. The things that, that go into our ethics include religion, they include literature, they include a range of values that inform our thinking, in, uh, in subconscious ways, but we need to bring those to the conscious level when we're thinking about how we program AI. We also need to be able to articulate clearly and plainly how it works. It doesn't mean putting out the source code. In fact, I wouldn't understand the source code if you put it out to me anyway. We need to explain what we're trying to do with that source code. What are the values that have been programmed into the AI? How will it react in the various scenarios? And if those, um, if, though, if that level of transparency can't withstand uh, the scrutiny, then that should cause us to have to reevaluate. Are we doing it the right way? And look, in some cases, there may be no right way because no matter what we pick, it may be controversial, may be disputed because in many cases, society hasn't had to grapple with these questions. Um, but that's the process that we have to undergo if we wanna reach a place in our society where people are comfortable ultimately with AI systems in whatever function it is that we're dealing. And, la and lastly, is there a fail safe? Is there a human appeal? I don't think that any of us for the foreseeable future will be comfortable with a situation where in important, situa in in important scenarios, important systems, we're at the mercy completely of an automated artificial intelligence without some ability to appeal to a human factor. And that appeal needs to be available and non-bureaucratic. It has to be um, relatively easy to access. Without that, I think it'll be very difficult to get the buy-in that we all need if we want AI to progress the way that, that we hope it does. So I think that um, that covers it up, uh, covers it. Thank you very much for your attention. I look forward to your questions.